Hey guys, this is Billy from AdultChello.com and today I kind of wanted to share actually some of the low points of my journey. I picked three points in particular and I, I decided to do this because I think first off it's important to share struggles because I we all struggle, especially if you're going to learn an instrument like the cello. And you know, we're all in this together and we all have times where we're just going to be really frustrated or dejected. I'm just going to give a warning right now. I'm probably going to come off, I think, like a drama queen. I'm just worried about that, but I'm going to go for it anyway. It might sound a little melodramatic, and honestly, none of this is like sob story. No one died. Everything's fine. But I still think what I really felt low <laughs> when I was going through these points, and I want to share them because I can hopefully give you some insights that will really be helpful for your journey as well. So this week's video is actually was kind of an idea I had after making last week's video because I was talking about plateaus and sort of the journey that most of us have and how it can be a little tough at times. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so chapter one, I had just had the best lesson of my life and I was ready to quit, maybe. What happened was I'd been playing for a couple years and I was kind of generally feeling a little stuck and I was, I thought maybe you know, a, a lesson from someone might help. And I kind of finagled my way into a lesson with my first kind of real world-class teacher. He was the cello teacher at the top conservatory here in LA. I, I wasn't even that nervous. That's how little I understood what I was doing <laughs> in terms of who I was playing for. And I, I had prepared the Sanson Concerto, so I played some of that. He stopped me at a certain point after I'd played for, you know, maybe four or five minutes. And then with just really sweet and really helpful, he proceeded to kind of tear apart everything <laughs> down to the studs, like completely shred everything I'd been working on. The left hand, how I, how I even dropped the fingers down, I mean, just the, the minutia, the right hand, the bow grip, everything. For an hour, he just cataloged everything he could think of that he saw that was a problem, which was essentially everything I did. So I'm in the car and I'm on the way home, and that was when I kind of felt super dejected because I, I felt like I was building this mansion in my mind that I like this ideal cellist, this this path I'm on. But I I hadn't checked with the planners, and the plot of land I picked was a swamp. And so it dawned on me after this lesson that. The further I go down this road, the more I build this this building, it's just the weight of it on a bad foundation is just, it's gonna just collapse into the swamp. And so what's needed, it's not more building. I have to re like tear the whole house down, go to a different foundation and start again. That was when I was kind of like, okay, I have two options. I could quit because I bit off more than I could chew. I don't know if I have it in me to just totally rework everything. Or I had begged him at the end of the lesson please let me play one more time. He was clearly not interested in teaching me another lesson ever again. But I finally, he relented and said, come back in three weeks. So I, I was like, okay, then I have to basically practice like eight hours a day for those three weeks and try to implement all this stuff as much as possible. At the end of the second lesson, he said, oh, okay, all right, well, why don't you come back and get, you know, give me a call in a couple of weeks. And that was what led to eventually like a, a four year study period with him. What I learned from that really low point was that the important thing is to really put in effort and to go for it. And even if you get off in the weeds, you can course correct. I think a lot of people are perfectionists and they're scared of really ingraining a bad habit. That's probably the biggest fear I hear from the, the students I'm teaching who are just starting off. That can get so big in your mind that you kind of just take this really meager attempt at everything because you're just trying to do everything perfectly. In order to get that lesson to get going with the rest of my journey, I had to put in three years of really hard work in the wrong direction <laughs> because I, you know, it gave him something to work with. So it's more important to just go for it than to try to get everything perfect all the time. All right, chapter two is titled The Dreaded T Word, Tendinitis. So I had just gotten out of school and I was finally, the phone's starting to ring a little bit. I'm getting called to play a church gig, play a wedding, you know, getting some work, freelancing. I'm really excited. I'm also still super passionate about becoming a better cellist. So I'm taking weekly lessons still. I'm just really working hard, really busy, really not eating well 
really not stretching or exercising. And eventually that led to this moment where I realized, okay, every time I sit down to play, if I don't totally back off my pinky, if you know, by the third or fourth time I play a note, I'm feeling like this lightning bolt of pain starting at the pinky going all the way up my forearm. And I'm, I'm at the point, I might have to like turn down work, which as a freelance person who's just breaking in, it, it felt like a death sentence to my possible career. Um, and also, I don't know what's going on with my pinky. I'm, it might be tendon, I don't know what's going on, but I, it keeps happening. This is like a nightmare. So as I, I talked about a little bit in last week's video, so I'll just kind of summarize that I threw everything I could at it to try to figure it out. Physical therapy, Alexander technique, yoga, I finally changed my diet, which really helped. All these things helped a lot, but it was just this really low period where I felt completely kind of out of control of my body for the first time. I'd grown up doing sports, but I'd never had something like this where it's just like, I, I just don't know how to, how to move forward. So what I learned from this is that there are things you can do even if you're compromised. First off, the, the biggest, one of my biggest takeaways was mental practice. I got, I, I got really invested in that because I had to limit the reps severely for a while on my left hand. So I would do the mental practice, which is you're basically rehearsing the, the motions exactly as, as, as exactly as possible in your mind what you're going to be doing. So how does the string feel? How does your hand feel balanced? You know, what note, where are the notes? Like, what are the motions you're going to use? What I found was that the better I got at mental practice, when I would finally sit down and try it with the left hand physically, it, it did actually feel like I had been practicing. So that was proof to me that mental practice actually works. I thought maybe people were just, either it's like a superpower they had or that it doesn't actually work. It's just people say to do it. It, it really does work, especially if you put in the time to, to get good at, at practicing mentally. And the second thing I learned was that Eventually, I realized, you know, to to fix this situation, I can't heal and then keep playing the way I'm playing. Like I realized, eventually, the way I'm playing cello, the the way I'm doing it, has to change. So it's not about healing up and then getting back into it. I have to rebuild my technique completely to be way like softer, less tension, more supple. At the time it felt incredibly frustrating because that meant that instead of just going back and returning to the pieces I was working on, I'm just working on like, can I get first finger down and then transfer to third finger without over squeezing? Just way, strip it all the way back down to the basics. You know, when I talk to you today, I'm super happy I did that because it really fixed the problem with, with a lot of my tension, but it also, that kind of more supple approach to cello playing enabled me to do more advanced things because there were the tension was blocking me from ever having a decent vibrato, for example. So it really did help in more ways than just keep me out of tendonitis. All right, final chapter here. Chapter three is I hate the way I sound and I hate myself, <laughs> which I, that's like a, a quote. I literally said that to my wife and I'll explain what happened. So a couple years ago, we took a vacation to Italy and I'm sort of a very, I've always been very obsessive about practicing. So this was something I had to kind of get over. I was going to put the cello down for nine days and return to it. So I did it. It was a very inspiring trip. All the while during the trip, I was doing lots of mental practice and I was listening to these pieces I was working on for an upcoming recital and really zeroing in on exactly how I wanted everything to sound finally get home, get out the cello, and I played for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then I just kind of turned to my wife and I said that. I was like, I, I hate how I sound. Like, I hate myself. I hate this. I just hate it. Two things were happening. First off, my ears were kind of cleaning out in a way, and as was my hand and my arms, everything. I wasn't constantly bombarding myself with reps and practice and daily daily work, so my ears and when I came back, they were very sensitive to what was actually happening. I think when you practice, it's easy to, f to focus on both what you hear, but also what you feel. Mm -hmm. And so if something feels good, that doesn't necessarily mean that it sounds good. That doesn't necessarily mean that it sounds good. And I think that was a big 
disparity <laughs> that was in my playing. I mean, we all talk about it. It's something, it's very hard to hear yourself objectively as you play. This was like suddenly I had, you know, miraculous level ears and I was just hearing every little thing that wasn't how it should be. The other reason I was able to hear this so well is because the time away from practicing, I spent more time doing the mental practice and really just like furnishing the recording, the internal recording in my mind and really getting down to the minutia exactly how I wanted everything to sound. So I had these like this very clear idea of what I wanted and then this very highly attuned set of ears that was picking up all the things that weren't matching with my ideal sound. And together it was just like a total slap in the face that I was un I wasn't expecting at all. I thought maybe that day I was going to end up practicing 5 hours or something like just oh, I can't get enough of this and I played just 10 minutes and I was like I get this thing away from me. I don't, I don't want anything to do with this. I'd rather just buy CDs of, of good players than listen to that. Um, so, <laughs> so now if you look at it from a different perspective, which I did after a few days of being super grumpy, what I realized is that these breaks, enforced breaks are needed for artistic growth and that being completely driven to, you know, put in the reps and put in the hard work that gets you to a certain point, but you also need time to be away from the instrument and reflect and kind of allow things to, to clear out and come back refreshed so that you can actually not just feel better, but also hear yourself better and really understand what's needed to get yourself to the next level. I think in my mind, it was always a question of, I need to take breaks sometimes because physically I need to let my body heal, I need to let it rest. It never was about the artistic side. The thing is with playing day in, day out, consistently practicing is it's almost like if you're looking at one of those pointillist paintings, you know, the impressionist and the pointillist, and it's, you get close enough and it's just dots of paint and they're beautiful colors and everything, but you don't really see the big picture. You don't know what you're looking at. And taking a break allows you to step back, take in the overall picture. And that's what I learned from that trip is that artistically you will probably almost definitely grow more if you enforce maybe once a year you take a week off at least and you just get distance and then come back fresh it, it really is a great thing especially if you're expecting to be surprised by what you hear i wasn't expecting at that time and that's why i was so despondent but now it's something i look forward to and it's also nice to have a reason to stop practicing for a week it's okay Nothing, nothing's going to happen. So there you go. There's the three low points of my journey so far. I'm sure there'll be more in the future, but um, I just wanted to share that. And I hope that some of the things I've learned from these low points will help you in your journey. And uh, yeah, if you've had low points, I'd love to hear about them in the comment section. It's, it's fun to just kind of share these and, and get them off our chest and then move forward. So, all right. See you next week.